which alhamdulillah to a certain extent is catering for our needs and our necessities. But then do we ever ask ourselves, is my heart in my home? Because home is where the heart lies. Ask yourself when you're coming back from work, do you, do you really want to get home? Or are you looking for every opportunity to make an esco- escape and go elsewhere? So the reality is we have a beautiful structure, but we don't have the ideal home. And today, unfortunately, we find we have a dysfunctional society because our family structures are not in order. The individuals of our society are growing up in dysfunctional homes. If we grow up in ideal homes, there will be correct morals, ethics, character, there will be a vision, there will be mahabba, there will be love, there will be affection. It will be a home where a person's heart will be. He will wish to spend more time in that home. Rewind a few months ago, a few years, when we were in COVID, for some it was the best thing on earth. For them, lockdown was the best thing on earth. Because why? Lives were so hectic. They never had the opportunity to bond with their families and spend quality time at home. So it now gave them the opportunity of spending some time and bonding with their kids. And for others it was Jahannam on earth. It was hell on earth. Because why that mutual understanding wasn't there? They woke up to a fight and went to bed with a fight. May Allah protect us all. So brothers, a home is not a structure. That is only the building. That is what we will refer to as the house. Home is where, alhamdulillah, we as a family, we share the same vision. We share, we share the same goal. We have a beautiful manner of interacting with one another based on respect, based on good character. It's a home where everyone is on the same page. It's a home where We bond and we are close with our children. And where the children have respect for their elders. It's a home where as a family we do activities together. We do things together. And it is a home where we constantly making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us forward and to take us from strength to strength. How are we going to get to this ideal home? It's not just going to happen overnight, but an effort needs to be made. Ibrahim والسلام, is leaving his family in the barren lands of Makkah al Mukarramah. He's making Makkah his home. He makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from this dua, we can understand the vision that Ibrahim والسلام, had. So he mentions beautifully and Allah Ta'ala mentions it in the Quran. Rabbana inni askantu min dhuriyati biwad biwad in ghayri di zar'in inda baytika al-muharram Rabbana liyuqimu as-salat but oh Allah, why am I making all this sacrifice? I brought my family here to Makkah to Makarram. I'm settling down in this barren lands of Makkah. Why? Number one and primary objective is so that my family may establish salah. What we learn from this is the first and foremost goal and vision of every home and their priority should be their deen. How this home can be a means of us getting closer to Allah. How this home can be a means of us fulfilling every commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Number two, Allah has placed us in this world. We ought to love, we need to earn, we need to eat. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam, look at the dua that he makes. وَرُزُقُهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ Oh Allah, provide for my family with your fruits. Fruits does not only refer to the fruits that we eat, but it refers to every form of benefit. Now if Ibrahim wanted to, he could have made dua to Allah that, Oh Allah, turn the barren lands of Mecca into fertile lands. But that would mean that his family would have to toil and they have to work on the lands. So he adopted a very different approach. Oh Allah, you provide for them. Oh Allah, I want their objective to be your deen, to please you, to get closer to you. Now, Ya Allah, you take it upon yourself to provide for them. And this is what our scholars refer to as easy sustenance. We should always make dua to Allah. Ya Allah, grant me my sustenance with ease. Rizq is muqaddar. It is destined. time. Now it's up to us how we want to acquire our risk and our sustenance. For example, 20 liters of water have been written down for you. It's up to you if you want to take that 20 liters from one tap or you want to take it from 10 taps. If you want to take it from one source or you want to take it from multiple sources. If you want to take it with ease or you want to tire yourself out in the process. So here he is making dua to Allah. Ya Allah, you provide for them. Ya Allah, grant them sustenance. So we should always make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide us with easy sustenance. And some ulama scholars go to the extent of explaining easy sustenance is where Allah has made it such, others are working and you earning. So Allah has put you in such a position where others are working and alhamdulillah you are earning which means you don't have to devote bulk and majority of your time towards your earnings and your sustenance. More of your time can now be devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the ibadah and the servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah provide for them. The third thing he mentions is, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ oh Allah, I want my family to be thankful to you. Provide for them so that they may be thankful to you. Which means, even their worldly material possessions that you will provide for them, that should also be a means of them getting closer to you, O oh Allah. So beginning, the objective and vision is for them to establish salah. In between, Allah provide for them. And at the end, O oh Allah, they should be thankful to you. Whatever benefit they enjoy in this world should be a means of them drawing closer to you, O oh Allah. Now this is a vision that we all ought to have for our families. That, oh Allah, another beautiful dua. Hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun. Oh Allah, grant us such spouses and such offspring that will be the coolness of our eyes. But where does coolness of the eyes lie? Does it lie in material means to a certain extent? But true coolness of the eye and true coolness of the heart lies in when you see your child obeying Allah. There is nothing that will bring more happiness to a person's heart than seeing his family in the servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask a father whose son became hafid of Quran. What was the joy that he experienced? He'll tell you that this is a joy that you won't get anywhere else. It's a different joy. He'll tell you, I won many different accolades. But the highest accolade is when my son memorized the kalam of Allah, the Quran and Majid. This is deen and this is the beauty of deen. And this is where the heart lies and this is where peace lies and this is where solace and tranquility lies. So the vision has to be correct. That to establish the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for that to be our priority. Then yes, we need to earn, but we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us our sustenance with ease and with comfort. Further, it is important for every family to be on the same page. 
When Ibrahim والسلام, made various sacrifices, he had to leave his family now in the barren lands of Makkah al Mukarramah. He was under the divine command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His wife is asking him, Are you going to leave us behind here? There's no means of survival. But Ibrahim والسلام, remained silent. When she asked, Is this the command of Allah? And he nodded in the affirmative. Then she said, إِذَنْ لَا يُضَيِّعُونَ الله. If you are fulfilling the command of Allah, Allah will never destroy us. So that person who has made his or her objective to fulfill the commandments of Allah, then Allah will never make his life a difficult one. Allah will never destroy him or ruin him. But rather the help of Allah will always, will always be with him or with her. But now there had to be some sort of sacrifice. No means of survival, she runs from Safa to Marwa, Safa to Marwa. And through the barakat and the blessings of a sacrifice, Allah blesses us with Zamzam, which the Ummah benefited from her time right up until now. There's never been any shortage of Zamzam. How many leaders go throughout the world? Through the barakah of sacrifice that is made for deen, Allah will give us such barakat and such blessings that will not be short-lived, but rather it will move in our generations. Many a time you'll find a successful family. When you look at the reason for their success, you'll find it was not their father or grandfather, but sometimes you'll find it was few generations up. Someone made sacrifice. Through his sacrifice, the whole family is benefiting generation after generation. But the point here is when Ibrahim والسلام, told his wife, this is a command of Allah, she accepted, she understood. And she said, if that is the case, Allah will never destroy us. Which meant they were on the same page. She didn't say, what's wrong with you? That you want to leave us here? There's no means of survival. You want to go away, enjoy your life? And you want to put us in the difficult situation? She didn't object because she was on the same page. When Ibrahim والسلام, had to sacrifice his son Ismail he asked his son, he didn't just force it upon him, but he engaged with his son. And this is important. As a family for us to engage, we don't rule with the iron fist because that won't bring love and affection. So he asks his son, Fandur Mada Tara. What's your opinion? And what was the response of the son? Ya Abati, oh my beloved father. If Alma took Mar, you do as you have been commanded to do. Why again he was on the same page? So it's important for the family to be on the same page. And this will happen when we communicate with each other, we speak with one another, we share what we learn with one another, we make time for one another. Otherwise, Allah protect us all. As a father, I'll be too busy in my business. My children will be too busy with their work. My wife will be in her interest and will be a scattered family that portrays themselves as one happy family. It can't work. It will only work to a certain extent. But then there will be major problems. Hence we see the high rate of divorce today. May Allah protect us all. So we need to engage by engaging with our children, taking their opinions into consideration, will fully understand what they're going through. If you look at the way Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam interacted, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a stepson, Umar ibn Abi Salama. So he was seated with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once, and they were sharing a plate of food. Now when he was eating with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his hands began to move around the plate. So what we learn from this is, this youngster was comfortable with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was very easy going. He wasn't scared of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because if someone is scared, he will not be free. Here this youngster was totally free with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did as he wished. So he started to move his hands around the plate and eat from the different, different parts of the plate. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam observed. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw the whole situation, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa understood that I need to correct the stepson of mine. What he's doing is incorrect. He should not be eating from all around the plate. 
Rather, you should be eating from the front. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now educates him. But look at the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam educates him. He first acknowledges the right that he's doing. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commences by telling him, Ya Ghulam, oh young boy, Sammillah. When you eat, then first you take the name of Allah. Now this youngster had already taken the name of Allah. So Alhamdulillah, he felt good. Alhamdulillah, I did something. This was acknowledgement first. Kul biyaminik. He was eating with his right hand. Rasulullah s.a.w. told him, eat with your right hand. So again, Rasulullah s.a.w. is acknowledging him. So he feels good. Alhamdulillah. And then gently Rasulullah s.a.w. corrects him and tells him, wa kul mimma yaliq. And eat from the food that is in front of you. Now this is the method of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to correct in a gentle manner, to acknowledge. Today we don't have the time to acknowledge. The only time we engage with our kids and with our families is when we have a problem. So we're not we're not engaging with them. We're not acknowledging them. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us so beautifully. It was one Sahabi when he came to the masjid. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam went into ruku. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam went into ruku, out of desire to get that rakat and not to miss that rakat, he commenced his salah at the door of the masjid. He said Allahu Akbar. He went into ruku. And then whilst he was in ruku, he walked to the saf and he joined the salah. Now this is incorrect. But look at the way Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam corrected him. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam tells him. Zadaka Allah hirsan. May Allah increase your desire. Acknowledges him. Doesn't look at his action, but looks at his intention behind the action first. Rasulullah <coughs> Sallam praises his intention, and then if a person is doing wrong, you can't leave the person to do wrong. Gently, Rasulullah Sallam tells him, hey, "Don't do it again. May Allah increase your desire." You really wanted to get the rakat. You didn't want to miss the rakat. So may Allah increase your desire. But at the same time, don't do it again. Aisha radiyallahu anha, in explaining the way Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam interacted, she says, "Lam yakun Rasulullah sallam fahishan, wala mutafahishan." Fahish refers to a person who is indecent in his nature. Indecency that pertains to a person's speech, a person's actions, and a person's mannerism. So she says, Rasulullah sallallahu was not obscene or indecent in his nature. Generally, it refers to indecency in speech. Then she further says, "Wala mutafahishan." Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam never used obscene language, but rather Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a gentle human being. Sometimes outside we have an image to uphold. So Alhamdulillah, in the workplace we are at our best behavior. But coming into our homes, we take out all the frustration, and all the different adjectives go flying around, and all the different French language and the F words also go flying around. Now, the Billah may Allah protect us all. Allah, this was not the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He went to the extent of saying, "Akmal al-Mu'minin iman and ahsan hum khuluqan." He said, "If you really want to have the best level of iman, the most perfect level of iman, then you need to have the best character." He said, "Khairukum khairukum li ahli." The best from amongst you is the one who is best to his family, and I lead by example. Wa ana khairukum li ahli. I am the one who is best to my family as well. So he led by example. He was never obscene in his no in his home. He never acted like a nabi. That is why Aisha radiallahu anha said, "In his home, kind of bashar and min al bashar, he was like an ordinary human being. He never regarded the normal household chores to be below his dignity. But rather, Aisha radiallahu anha says, 'Yafli thawbahu Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم would check his clothing to see if there was any lice.'" At times, if there was any sewing required, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would mend his own clothing. He would mend his own sandals. He would do the household chores. When he would move with his Sahaba radiyallahu anhu, Sahaba wanted to serve him, but he did not want to be the most distinguished amongst them. 
So if they were on a journey and a goat was slaughtered, the responsibilities would be divided amongst them. Rasulullah Sallallahu would take the responsibility of gathering the firewood. Sahaba would say, oh, Nabi of Allah, leave it, we'll do it. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Sahaba, I know happily you will do it, but I do not wish to be the most distinguished amongst you. He was like a normal human being. So in our homes, we need to put our titles aside. We need to put our position aside. Now in our home, we need to understand I'm a husband and I'm a father. I need to behave the way a husband needs to behave. And I need to behave the way a father needs to behave. I need to lead by example. Further, Aisha radiallahu says, وَلَا يَجْزِي بِالسَّيِّئَةِ السَّيِّئَةِ Rasulullah Sallallahu never avenged a wrong with another wrong. بَلْ يَعْفُ وَيَصْفَحُ But rather he will always forgive and forget. And to understand this, let us take a look at the incident of Zayd ibn Sa'ana radiallahu anhu. So Zayd ibn Sa'ana was a very learned person from among the Yahud. He says, مَا مِنْ عَلَامَاتِ النُّبُوَةِ There was not a sign of Nubuwa that I did not find on the blessed face of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Except two I was still searching for. Number one is, يَسْبِقُ حِلْمُهُ جَهْلَهُ Which means, the gentleness, the forbearance and tolerance of Rasulullah will always overcome his ignorance and anger. And this is something, brothers, we need to bring in our homes. The second is, he says, وَلَا تَزِيدُهُ شِدَّةُ الْجَهْلِ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا حِلْمًا The more ignorant, the more foolish a person behaved towards him, the more tolerant and forbearant Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was towards that individual. So he says, I wanted and I waited for an opportunity to test these two qualities. There was a day where a person came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Oh Nabi of Allah, my tribe accepted Islam. And I promise them that goodness will come to them. But unfortunately, the reality is now they are suffering with drought. I fear they may renounce Islam. Oh Nabi of Allah, if you feel it appropriate, then send some wealth for them. At that time, Rasulullah Sallallahu looked at the Sahabi, perhaps it was Ali radiallahu anhu, and he mentioned to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Oh Nabi of Allah, there's nothing that we have available at the moment. Zaid said, this is my opportunity. So immediately, he said, Oh Muhammad, if you wish, I am prepared to give you wealth, and you can then pay me with dates. And I'm not going to go into the details, I'm running out of time. The deal was made. About two or three days before the due date, he comes to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now his objective is to behave in a foolish, in an ignorant manner, with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi to see the response of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he says, Oh Muhammad, you should pay your debt. You will, the family of Abdul Muttalib, you are very bad payers. Imagine somebody insults you. Rasulullah says, me seated with Sahaba, Abu Bakr, Umar, radiallahu ta'ala, anhumah, etc. Umar radiallahu becomes furious. And he's ready, he threatens this person, I'll hit your head off if it's not for the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is smiling, he said, oh Umar, relax. Oh Umar, you should advise him to be better in demanding his payment and advise me to become a better payer, oh Umar. Then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Umar, go and pay him. Go and give him his, what is due to him all the dates. Give him 20 sa extra, which is more than 60 kilos of dates extra. So when Umar Radiyallahu Alaihi gives Zayd, Zayd said, hey, why are you giving me this extra amount? Umar said, because I threatened you, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I must give you more. So he says, oh Umar, do you know me? Do you recognize me? So Umar said, I don't know you. He says, I'm Zayd ibn Sana." Umar says, Al-Hibr, are you the learned man from amongst the Jews? He said, yes. So, but now wait. You, supposed to be that learned individual. You ought to recognize Rasulullah Sallam. Why did you behave with him in such a foolish manner? So he says, oh Umar, there were two things I was looking for. I needed to test the tolerance of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I wanted to see whether he is gentleness, tolerance and forbearance will overcome his anger. And the more foolish I behave towards him, 
the more tolerant he will behave towards me. And Alhamdulillah, I found it to be genuine, to be true. And that is when he said, oh, Umar, I make you a witness that I have now accepted Islam. And I make you a witness that half my wealth will now be for the Muslim Ummah. Brothers, this akhlaq of Rasulullah Sassam character has to be brought in the home. When somebody has a hard time and having a bad day in the home, if they behaving in an ignorant manner, you cannot confront ignorance with ignorance, anger with anger. Someone has to have a gentle approach, a forbearant approach. Someone will have to back off. And if we do this, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us the mahabba and the love and affection that we ought to enjoy as a family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.